Up next, we're gonna go behind the top 10 songs of this very same week from the year 1987. One of my favorite years in music. It's 34 years ago, it's hard to believe that. We're gonna re-rank them based on their performance since, and you're gonna be shocked at what artists we have interviews with trickled in here. Very cool. Who do you think has the new number one song? Is it George Michael, Guns N' Roses, Sting, Belinda Carlisle, Def Leppard? We're gonna find out. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of our Music History Daily straight from the artist. Click the bell so you never miss out. And if you'd like, check out our exclusive content on Patreon. The link for that is below in the description. That helps us to keep creating this. We give you more content. Check out our new merch as well. Since we're talking about 87, I've got the Vintage Years Collection 87 that I'm sporting here. It's got Axel from Guns N' Roses, George Michael, Bono from U2, and Joe Elliott from Def Leppard. That's right below. So it's time for another edition of our show, The Hit Song Redux, my favorite. This is where we travel back to a week in the golden era of rock and roll. We re-rank the top 10 songs of that specific week based on their legacy since uh, their peak position on the Billboard Hot 100. It includes your stories, your dedications, as well as artist interviews. This program is dedicated to my hero, Casey Kasem. And this time we're going to travel back to the end of this week in November of 1987. We have yet another cool twist to shake things up. At the very end, I think you're going to really dig this one. Now, before we get into the top 10, to get us into that uh, nostalgic mood. The top movies at the box office that week were Three Men and a Baby with Tom Selleck, Ted Danson, and Steve Gutenberg. Three Men and a Baby. I think she did a doodle. Your turn to change her. Also had John Hughes' classic comedy, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Hilarious. A new film by John Hughes. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And the Michael Douglas, Glenn Close thriller, Fatal Attraction. I guess he thought you'd get away with it. Well, you can. I won't be ignored. Freaky show. On TV, um, on Thursday nights at that time on NBC, it was all the rage. I mean, he had four of the top seven TV shows, including the top three right in a row. Cosby Show, A Different World, Cheers, and then Night Court, my favorite. It was just, it was a wonderful time to be alive. So let's get into it. So coming in at number 10, you know, 1987 was the year that we really had to take sides. You had to decide what team you were on, who you were gonna support. Were you Team Debbie or Team Tiffany? I'm talking about Team Boppers, Debbie Gibson or Tiffany. We get our first taste of the fight on these charts with a number 10 hit, Shake Your Love by Debbie Gibson. I had a, a terrible crush on both, and I'm sure you did too. Here's what Debbie Gibson had to say about her explosion onto the charts in 1987. I was running around with uh, like literally a lunch bag, <laughs> a brown paper bag, <laughs> with individual cassettes, of because I'd throw them on like a 10-minute cassette each song, and, and I would dump the bag on Doug and Ahmed Erdogan's desk oh my and say, here's my album. I think they were like, is this for real? Like Doug and the and the creative powers that be said, no, Shake Your Love needs to be second. And I fought them on it and they were totally right. Um, I mean, who knows if staying together would have been yeah. it too, but Shake Your Love, it was the right move. It's a great beginning too. I love the dun 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 And it's still like, is it one? Dun 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 Like when I'm trying to teach it to a band or we're trying to program it for something, it's always like, what is that? Shake your love. I mean, my sister was obsessed with Debbie Gibson. She even had the, uh, the electric youth perfume, if you remember that. Now, Shake Your Love has had about six million streams since its peak performance. Coming in at number nine, the follow-up hit to this band's electrifying number one hit, I Just Died In Your Arms Tonight. It's cutting crew with the 80s hidden gem, I've Been In Love Before. Here's what lead singer Nick Van Eed said about writing the song. And it just sounded good, so I started pumping away on the chords. I was still living at home then, for heaven's sake. Mum was like going, uh, 
come up. It's lunch now, Nick. And I was like, no, I got something going on. I got something going on. And she said, well, it'll go cold. You know, we all have that. <laughs> yeah. And the chords are very beautiful. They're just very simple. Well, I can sing it, I don't know. Catch my breath. Close my eyes. At the number eight position, uh, it's the man who started a new wave band that transcended the genre and became the biggest band of the early 80s with the biggest song in 1983. Uh, he went solo in 85. It's Sting with a We'll Be Together from his 1987 sophomore album, Nothing Like the Sun. Sting said about this song, and I quote, We'll Be Together is funny because it was written as a beer commercial for a Japanese company called Kirin. I like the idea of music being a craft. I'm not precious about it. They wanted a song, and the only prerequisite was uh, the word together. So I wrote the song in about 3 minutes and 49 seconds, which is exactly the length of the song. Japanese loved it, and then the record company loved it too. This is exactly what we need, but I didn't invest anything in this song. I just put it together. They said, no, no, it's a hit. And it was. It's probably the only straight rock track on the collection. End of quote. Now, the original recording of this song included Eric Clapton on guitar, uh, while other takes uh, feature Brian Lauren instead. The version with Clapton uh, came out later on Sting's 1994 greatest hits album, Fields of Gold, The Best of Sting, uh, 84 to 94. <laughs> I always dug this middle of the road rocker. You know, Sting's solo career was quite a departure from his days with the police, but I really love the variety. By the way, this song has uh, garnered about 7 million streams since its release. Coming in at number seven, it's the other challenger in the teen pop rivalry, Tiffany, with her remake of Tommy James and the Shondells hit, I Think We're Alone Now. Really, Tiffany and Debbie are good friends, but it was all fun at the time. Now, I had a chance to talk to Tiffany as well, same day I talked to Debbie. And this is what she said about the Tommy James classic. In fact, we have Tommy James here as well. I think we have that. Check it out. I had never heard I Think We're Alone Now before. Um, didn't know of Tommy James and the Shondells. If I had, I didn't really make the connection. George said, well, just learn the song. So I did learn the song, came back the next day, and it was all this dance track. But for me, I was a little worried about getting typed as a dance artist. I mean, George sat down and he said, listen, you gotta trust me on this, really. I, I, I think this will work. Do you know she came up to me and apologized? And I said, apologize? I said, are you kidding? No, what, you apologizing for number one? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? And she's such a nice, uh, a nice lady. She really is, Tiffany. As we go into the number six position, I want to recognize our awesome sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Zenny's going to change the way you think about glasses because their prices are so cost effective and their style and customization are second to none. Go design your own pair and add the blue blocks feature and you'll be ahead of the curve. Go to zenny.com to check that out today. So in at the number six position, it's a superstar whose previous album to this point was a massive blockbuster. Uh, it had seven top 10 singles on it. Only Michael Jackson had done that at that uh, particular point in time. And he, of course, had massive sold-out concerts that lasted three hours. He followed up that life-changing fame with a low-key honest album about relationships. It's Bruce Springsteen with his first single from Tunnel of Love, the album, The Great Brilliant Disguise. It was quite possibly the deepest song on the radio in that moment. Now, the lyrics of Brilliant Disguise represent a confession of self-doubt on the part of the singer. The honest emotions expressed in the song include uh, confusion, jealousy, and anxiety about uh, whether the singer's companion has become a stranger to him. Tell me who I 
The song deals with the, the masks that people wear and the bitterness that can ensue when we realize the darkness that can hide behind those masks. I'm off in the darkness of our love. The boss was in the throes of this when he wrote it. Uh, you know, his first marriage was falling apart, Julianne Phillips. I love the last line, which sums up the entire album perfectly of Tunnel of Love, in my opinion. God have mercy on the man who doubts what he's sure of. Who doubts what he's sure of. This song has been really popular since its release. It's gotten about uh, 60 million streams since that point. Coming in at number five, a song that would launch a former teen heartthrob into the stratosphere. It would end up being the number one hit of the next year, 1988. It's former whammer George Michael with Faith. I guess it would be nice if I could touch your body. Title track from the album of the same name. This would be the song that really would launch George Michael into that league. That same league with Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, and Whitney Houston vying for chart domination. Faith was written, produced, and arranged by George Michael himself. It went to number one on the U.S. album charts for 12 weeks and it spawned uh, four number one U.S. singles, title track Faith, uh, Father Figure, One More Try, and Monkey. Faith sold over 10 million copies in the U.S. and is nearly 25 million worldwide. Now, the church organ that uh, you hear at the beginning of Faith that's actually playing Wham's Freedom. And it was really symbolic of the end of that era for George Michael and his new path with an enthralling rockabilly track. borrowed from the great Bo Diddley. A familiar beat. Uh, we have so many of our viewers who commented on this classic. Here's some great stories. Uh, DW3010 said, and I'll quote it exactly. He says, at the peak of George Michael's popularity, we had to write our names in school on those, uh, hello, my name is name tags. I wrote my name as George Michael. When I raised my hand to answer a question and the teacher said, yes, George Michael, class erupted with laughter. I was sent to the principal's office. I had to write out, my name is not George Michael, 50 times. That was very cool. Screen name, a drone board shared, and I quote, I specifically remember going to the dentist and they asked if I wanted to listen to headphones while they drilled and put in fillings. I, of course, said, sure. While I was sitting there, George Michael's faith played in the headphones. And I thought, well, that's appropriate. Uh, now, many of our female viewers, including Kimberly Davis and Tracy and a few others, remember George Michael as one uh, of their 80s heartthrobs. And uh, screen name Go Padres recalls the hilarious Dana Carvey SNL skit. Look at my butt. The worst thing you can do is try to ignore it. Coming in at number four, we have the only male artist in history to have his first seven singles reach the top five on the Billboard charts. And through his career, has thus far scored a total of 14 number one singles, both as a performer and songwriter producer. It's Richard Marks with his brooding rocker, Shoulda Known Better. I had the opportunity to talk about this hit with Richard at length. Uh, we did an interview in his home a few years ago. Here's what he said about it. I'd come out of this, I'd come out of my first real relationship, which was a really dysfunctional, it was a long, it was long distance and it was, uh, it was, we were both really young, 19, 20, whatever, but it was, yeah. there were things, it was messed up. And it was the first time I'd ever really gotten my heart broken. And I was both hurt and really pissed off. Th those songs, like almost all of them, they just happen. 20 minutes will go by or 40 minutes or two hours. And it's just, it's there. It exists, whereas it didn't before. Another sleepless night I can't explain. 
Should've Known Better peaked at number three on the charts and has been streamed almost 20 million times since its release. So going to number three, we have a rare event on the charts. It's the second remake of a Tommy James hit in this top 10. First was Tiffany with I Think We're Alone Now. The second is a song that Tommy and his Shondells originally took to number three, written by Bobby Bloom, uh, Richie Cordell, Bo Gentry, and Tommy James. It's the live version of Money Money by Billy Idol. Just a few weeks earlier, Billy Idol actually replaced Tiffany at number one, so essentially Tommy's songs replaced each other at number one, very rare. Here's Tommy's take on that, as well as Billy's guitarist, Steve Stevens. Billy Idol and Tiffany, yeah. they went up the charts like they were holding hands. <laughs> I know. And uh, went back to back number one. That had never happened. I know. That's probably the way we would have done it if we had done it in the 80s. Yeah. And Billy had done the EP and they played me Moni Moni. And I said, oh, it sounds amazing. You know, it's sonically so solid. Actually, it's the, the the drummer on the original version is Frankie Benali, who passed away, the drummer from Quiet Riot. But I thought I was really excited to work with Keith Forsey because that was the first time I'd heard Keith and Billy together. And um, well, wow, this producer is really great, you know. But then it was decided, you know, that we'd release it, but we'd release a live version of it to kind of show people where the... Sh you know, by then we had a big production and everything. Billy's version of Moni Moni has had almost 90 million streams since it went to number one. Our viewer Heidi Christensen said that she was a big Tommy James and the Shondells fan uh, back when she was little. And she was really happy that Billy did a remake. She said she actually liked his version better. To each their own. I like both. Coming in at the number two position, uh, she was just inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of the Go-Go's. Yeah. She went solo and blew up with this song and this album. It's Belinda Carlisle with Heaven is a Place on Earth. Ooh, heaven is a place on Earth. They say after the Go-Go's went their separate ways, uh, Belinda Carlisle had an instant hit with her first single, Mad About You. But Heaven is a Place on Earth, that was a global smash, uh, topped the charts in several countries, including uh, the UK, the US, and Ireland. It was Carlisle's only UK or US chart topper, whether with or without the Go-Go's. Now, songwriter Ellen Shipley said about the song, the chorus came first when we had that title, Heaven is a Place on Earth. We went into a studio and we started jamming on chords and singing against it. And in our process, we got that chorus and everything was just built around that. Down, so it was like a story of why you think heaven is a place on earth because love comes first, hence the lyrics. You know, I remember seeing this world premiere video on MTV. I mean, who didn't love this song? It's kind of one of those classics that this year, 1987, was built on, played all over the place. It's been massive since then. It's had 325 million streams. Well, here we are at the number one position. And before I announce it, what is your guess? Think about it right now, 1987, November. It's a song that is indelibly tied to one of the biggest sleeper blockbuster films of 1987. It's uh, pretty much every woman's favorite movie. It's the duet between Bill Medley of the Righteous Brothers and Jennifer Warrens with I've Had the Time of My Life from the film Dirty Dancing. Now I had the time of my life. Now we have a full mini documentary on this song on our channel if you search for it, if you want to go in depth. Uh, here's what Bill Medley told me about the song, as well as the writers. 
and Bill didn't want to do it because it was in California and he was in New York and he didn't want to come out. And then when he had heard that um, Jennifer Warren was going to sing on it, he was like, oh, I always wanted to sing with her. You know, so they, they worked it out. So, you know, they talked him into it, but he didn't want to do another duet. His wife was, was having have a, a baby. baby. Right. Jimmy Einer, a uh, guy from uh, New York, was putting the, putting the music together for the movie. And boy, did a great job. Some great, they did a great job between doing old songs and new, and new stuff. And he called me and said, I want you to do a, a, a song for the movie, Dirty Dancing. I turned it down for three months because my wife was expecting our child. They wanted me to go from California to New York. I said, I can't do it. I promised my wife Paula that I would be there when uh, she gave birth. And, it, and almost every week, it seemed like every day, he called <laughs> Jimmy Einer and called, said, did she have the baby yet? I said, no. And uh, finally, it, uh, Paula had, the, had had our child, McKenna, who's now on the road with me and he singing, sings, sing, with sings yeah. it with me. Oh, man. So many viewers have memories of this song. Screen name Ruthless Mojo said, and I quote, my wife loves Dirty Dancing. It is her all-time favorite movie. And we recently celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary, so I would like to go with I've Had the Time of My Life as a dedication dedicated to Carolyn from her husband, Chris. Very cool. Screen name Gunter shared, and I quote, in early 1988, my best friend assured me he could invite a particular girl he fancied to dance with him. As soon as the DJ started to play some slows, I challenged him by telling him if he didn't ask her, I wouldn't speak to him for the rest of the evening. So he did. The song was, I've had the time of my life. And to this very day, my best friend and that girl are still married. So one of my favorite stories from this week comes from viewer Donna Katiris. She said, and I quote, my late husband and I danced to have had the time of my life the last time we danced. Uh, we met in November 1986. We had our first date on Valentine's Day 1987, and we eloped in May of that year. We were together until he passed, over 30 years. He didn't like to dance, but he would with me because I liked it, but only at home. But the last dance was to I've Had the Time of My Life from Dirty Dancing. Hey, the time of my life. He had a lot of patience with me wanting to watch that movie over and over again. Every time I hear that song, it takes me right back. When your husband is also your soulmate and best friend, the memories are always wonderful. Dancing with him was always special and the memories are perfect. He wasn't perfect. I certainly am not perfect, but our marriage and my memories are perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that, Donna. Okay. Wow. So before we re-rank these hits, one last thing, kind of the shakeup this week. So for this exact chart from 1987, there were so many other incredible songs that didn't make the top 10, that I believe uh, would rank as high as some of the top 10 hits in this chart that we just talked about. When looking at them with a long-term perspective, at least, the test of time to me is far more accurate uh, than what a DJ might be willing to play back in the day. Um, it's kind of like our show should have been a number one hit. Some of these artists and their songs were victims of a lot of things. Payola, weak marketing by labels. Uh, that meant less exposure in radio play. Maybe it didn't fit the style, the format of radio stations. But decades of hindsight put a lot in perspective. Pink Floyd's first single from their album, A Momentary Lapse of Reason, Learning to Fly, was about to fall off the chart in this particular week. And New Order's song, True Faith, was creeping up on the top 40. It would uh, only get as high as 32 a month later. Both of these songs have done very well since their release. And there were several other songs in the chart that were kicking around outside of the top 10. They weren't quite at their peak at that moment. They never got to the top 10. There's The Cure's Just Like Heaven. Ice House with Crazy. Crazy. Well, 
King Gang with Motortown. Hourglass by Squeeze. And Love Will Find A Way by Yes. Just to name a couple, none of these would, like I said, ever actually grace the top 10 in 87 or 88. For this week though, I'm gonna put these up against our top 10 that I just counted down and see how they do long term. Now from now on when I do these chart reduxes, uh, I'd like to find a way to include some of these songs um, if in fact they have outperformed the top 10 since that time. Maybe I do the top five songs for that week and then a top five that should have been in the top five from the chart, and then we re-rank all of them based on their performance since. But I wanna get your take. What do you think? Tell us in the comments, I would love to hear. So with all this in mind, here is the new top five songs based on all time performance, including the songs I just mentioned that didn't finish in the top 10. Here's your new top five based on all time views. At number five, it's Tiffany with I Think We're Alone Now with 222 million streams. And number four, The Cure with Just Like Heaven, 260 million streams. Yes, love it. Number three, Heaven is a Place on Earth by Belinda Carlisle with 325 million streams. And number two, it's George Michael with Faith. just under 350 million streams. And at number one, with close to a billion streams, it's a duet between Bill Medley and Jennifer Warnes. I've had the time of my life for Dirty Dancing. By the way, Pink Floyd's Learning to Fly finished just out of the top five. It's had about 165 million streams since then. So there it is, a new top five from the last week of November 1987 based on all time streams. How would you rank all these songs? How should we include the, the great songs that finish outside of the top 10 or even the top 40 from that time in the future? Let us know in the comments. It'll be a fun discussion. Share your memories of these songs and uh, make sure to pick up a 1987 Vintage Years collection. It's our collection, celebrating the great year. Now, if we didn't get to your dedication or memory, we will share with us in the comments. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below and check us out on Patreon, check out our merch, help us keep the music alive, that's always the goal. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.